and head of the People's Republic of China from 1949 until his death in 1976. Chairman Mao was called the sun in the sky. This may not be the same as the son of God, but it's pretty close. Chinese and foreigners first heard about him, Mao was a heavy smoker. Unfiltered camels were his preferred brand. In those days, men who smoked were sexy. Everything about Mao, including the cigarettes Mao smoked, was different from the tyrants and revolutionaries with whom he is usually classed. Stalin's father was an abusive drunk who abandoned his family. Stalin studied for the priesthood, but was expelled from the seminary. Hitler was an orphaned and failed art student who wasted away his small inheritance. Hitler wasn't his real name. It was Schickelgruber. Stalin's name was Juhashvili. Lenin was Vladimir Ilyich Ulinov. Trotsky was originally Lev Bronstein. Mao also wasn't much like the Jewish carpenter to whom, as we have seen, he has sometimes been compared. Mao Zedong was a solid member of the political and business community before he became a communist. He was tall and handsome with a great muscular body. He even wrote poetry in the classical literary style the communists later outlawed. Mao's father had been a soldier. Leaving behind the army, he bought land. In the he increased his holdings, hired a couple of laborers, and built up a side business as a moneylender and grain dealer. Still, the old man made his kids work. By the age of 13, Ma was carrying two heavy manure baskets, one slung over each shoulder. A life carrying shit might not conjure up a middle-class existence, but Ma was raised in rural China. Years later, Mao told the American reporter Edgar Snow that his father was a horrible son of a bitch and claimed that he, his mother, and brothers constantly formed united fronts to struggle against the old tyrant. The story makes it sound like Mao was a revolutionary from his youth. But wait. How did we get from this innocent boy of 13 to the yellow peril? After all, he was just a nice, upper-middle-class peasant kid, right? There's more to the story. Oh, she very hot. Mao admitted to Edgar Snow that his father paid his tuition bills until Mao was in his 20s, only occasionally grousing about the money Mao spent on magazines and periodicals. At the age of 17, Mao moved to the Hunan provincial capital of Changsha to attend middle school. Six months later, the Republican Revolution broke out. String up every aristocrat Out with the priests and let them live on their fat Mao's fellow students rushed to sign up. Mao sat on the sidelines. He had heard that Wuhan, where the initial uprising took place, was a rainy city. He didn't want to go without his galoshes. By the time he found his boots, the dynasty had been overthrown. At last, the Chinese Republic. Maybe I not need boots. A student brigade was formed to defend the revolution. Mao cautiously signed up with the regular forces, not the radical student troops. 
He later sheepishly admitted that, as an intellectual, he, unlike the other soldiers, hired men to carry his water. Soon, Mao enrolled in business school, gladdening his father's heart. Capitalism, very good. The business classes were mostly in English. Mao had to drop out and enroll in another school. In the next few years, he became a fervent believer in science and democracy. Even writing an article for the most famous national journal of the day, praising Theodore Roosevelt and his philosophy of physical fitness. A strong body makes a strong country. Mao organized exercise and hiking groups. With his fellow students, he would hike through the countryside without his shirt on, displaying his muscular physique. Mao, Mao, wait up! In June 1918, Mao graduated from his university. After a short visit to Beijing, he took a job teaching in Hunan. On May 4, 1919, students in Beijing took to the streets to protest the Western powers' decision to transfer former German concessions in China to Japan. Western imperialist sons of bitches take Chinese territory. The demonstrations quickly spread throughout the country. We want our rights. And we don't care how. We want our revolution now. Mao led the Hunan movement, speaking out for women's rights and democracy and protesting the growing foreign domination of China. The flags of the great powers concealed the clandestine plunder of the richest country of the East. There is no end to this humiliation. As he became better known in Hunan, Mao started a business, the Cultural Book Society. Books for sale cheap. It grew rapidly. Buy my books. Years later, Mao told the American reporter Edgar Snow that his love of spicy peppers was a Hunan thing. He joked that the pepper-loving peoples of the world were all revolutionaries. In 1920, Mao, now 27, married Yang Kai Wei, the daughter of his favorite teacher. Mao also became the principal of the first Hunan Elementary School. Mao was now a successful businessman married into one of the leading intellectual families in China. He was politically connected and had an important new job. When China's establishment intellectuals grew disappointed with the West, they formed the Chinese Communist Party. Mao followed. Solidarity forever. Solidarity. And so, says Mao Zedong, China's communist revolution must begin in the rural areas and sweep over the cities. Mao came to see the peasants as a spontaneous, unstoppable force. A single spark can start a prairie fire. He had previously shied away from terror and violence. Now he justified the actions of his peasant allies. A revolution is not a dinner party, or writing an essay, or painting a picture, or doing embroidery. It cannot be so refined, so leisurely and gentle, so temperate, kind, courteous, restrained, and magnanimous. A revolution is an insurrection, an action of violence by which one class overthrows another. The Soviets convinced the Chinese communists to ally with the Guomindang, or Nationalist Party, and aid them in reunifying China. When the Guomindang leader, Zhang Haishek, turned on his communist allies, Mao understood the party needed its own army. Every communist must grasp the truth. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. It was too late. Mao and his allies were forced to flee to the hills. In their mountain retreat, Mao and a thousand or so followers were joined by a small detachment of rebel soldiers led by Zhu Da, an army commander who had gone over to the communist side. Mao and Zhu Da formed the Red Army. 
Peng Duai, the man who was to become the Judas of the Chinese Revolution, joined them. To explain basic tactics to his soldiers, few of whom were educated, Mao preached from the mountain a series of easily remembered phrases, which he adapted from a 2,000-year-old military handbook, The Art of War. Enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy camps, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. After Peng's arrival, the retreat grew overcrowded. With Zhang's forces closing in, Mao and Zhu De decided to come down from the mountain. In early 1929, Mao and Zhu De left the unhappy Peng Duai to hold the fort and took off. And remember the Alamo. Years later, a bitter Peng remembered how the troops Mao promised would relieve him were never sent. You hold him out, Steve. Unlike those at the Alamo, Peng Duai hadn't exactly volunteered to stay behind. But also unlike Crockett, Bowie, and the Alamo gang, Peng eventually escaped to tell his side of the story. Son of a bitch. Mao's wife, Yang Kai Wei, had remained in Hunan. Word came to her that while still in his mountain retreat, Mao had shacked up with a virginal 18-year-old, He Zhujun. To show affection is natural, healthy, and desirable. When affection is returned, it may lead to romance. <laughs> Yang told her friends she felt like killing herself. Mao had second thoughts and wrote an acquaintance saying he missed Yang and the boys. Meanwhile, Mao and the new Mrs. Mao, He Zhejun, had a baby. On the arduous journey down from the mountain, they were forced to abandon the little girl to a peasant couple. We have to leave her. She was never found. Nor was Mao ever reunited with his former wife. In 1930, the warlord government in Hunan executed Yang Kai Wei, as well as an adopted sister of Mao's. Fearful relatives sent Mao's three sons to Shanghai. They lived on the streets. His youngest son died. The middle son became mentally deranged. Only Mao Anying, who was later killed in Korea, remained. Years later, a pensive Mao wrote a soulful poem about Yang Kai Wei, envisioning her soaring to heaven and being served a laurel brew. By the time he wrote, he'd had many other women and many other travails. After coming down from the mountain, Mao and Zhu De settled on the Jiangxi Fujian border. In the Jiangxi Soviet, Mao and Zhu De offered land reform to the peasants and insisted on a professional attitude among soldiers and cadres. They soon ruled an area of over nine million people. Five times, Jiang Kai shek amassed enormous armies and attacked the Jiangxi Soviet. Mao stuck to the tried and true strategy of smaller, less well-equipped forces since time immemorial. Mao let the Guomindan forces enter the Soviet with little opposition. He waited until he had superior intelligence and terrain, then pounced. Mao's strategy worked four times. It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Super Mao! Finally, Chiang Kai-shek turned to Nazi advisors. He assembled half a million men. The central leadership of the CCP brought in its own German advisor, Otto Braun. Otto abandoned Mao's guerrilla tactics. Otto failed. The desperate party remnants decided to flee. In October 1934, 86,000 men and 35 women that's right, only 35 women broke out of the encirclement. It is as if an army had been ordered to march on foot 6,000 miles through hostile territory in one year. Following a tortuous roundabout route, the communists cross 18 mountain ranges, some of them higher than the European Alps. Billed as an heroic adventure, the long march was in fact a disaster. 
in which the communists lost almost 90% of their forces. Mao's brother, who had been left behind, was killed. Mao's new young son, whom the brother had been caring for, disappeared. As they marched, Mao's wife gave birth again. The couple was once more forced to give the baby to local peasants. This daughter, too, was never found. Though in 2003, British hikers discovered an aging, illiterate peasant woman who they thought might be Mao's long-lost child. One bright spot for Mao was that during the march, he received Stalin's backing to become the supreme party leader. It wasn't much to brag about at first, but it turned out that Mao's genius was in convincing the outsiders who came to visit the communist new North China base camp that his small, bedraggled force was poised to take over all of China. There are only a few thousand communists in the caves of Yan'an. But from this humble beginning, their influence will grow and multiply, reach out and conquer. And Mao does something no military leader in China has done before. He sends his soldiers into the fields to work beside the peasants, to help them, and to talk to them of the new China, the communist China, in which landlords will be made to give up their farms to the peasants. Propaganda teams travel the countryside. Dancers perform morality plays in which the landlords are the devils and the communists are the forces of righteousness, trampling their class enemy. At the time of the Long March, the Japanese occupied northeastern China. Mao's claim that the communists had gone north to unite again with the Guomindang against Japan struck a chord with Chinese students. They demonstrated against Japanese aggression. Mao is on our side. The Guomindang strongman, Zhang Shuilian, was also taken by Mao's proposal that all Chinese unite against the Japanese. Sensing a problem, in 1936, Chiang Kai-shek flew to the Yan'an area to check why Zhang Shui-lian's forces weren't pursuing the communists. Zhang Shui-lian kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek, releasing him only after Chiang Kai-shek pledged to unite with the communists against Japan. On July 7, 1937, Japan invaded, quickly overrunning most of China. Shanghai, 1937. The blow falls. Japan strikes. The nationalist troops abandoned the countryside. In many areas, communists became the only indigenous force. Chinese students and intellectuals flocked to the communist base camp. So did foreign observers. The journalist Edgar Snow, the first to come, was soon followed by other reporters, including Agnes Smedley. Helped by her attractive, flirtatious translator, the actress Lily Wu, Smedley gave dancing lessons to the communist men in a nearby Catholic church. Mao's eye fell on Lily Wu. Tardy Mao, that lady's man. He ain't fixing for a bridal tour. Doesn't want a wife to settle yeah. down Had them a little on the side Tordy Mao, that lady's man He ain't fixed for a bridal tour Doesn't One night, want a, a distraught Huzza Jen, pregnant with her sixth child, barged in on Mao and Lily Wu. She hit Mao with her flashlight, then took out after Lily Wu, scratching her face and pulling her hair. Smedley, who'd been sleeping in the next room, came to see what was happening. Lily Wu tried to hide in back of Smedley. An angry Huzza Jen struck Smedley. With a single punch, the former cowgirl decked Huzza Jen. Mao tried to mollify Huzza Jen. The enraged woman left him to go to the Soviet Union, where she had their last child, a son. The baby caught pneumonia and died. It was the fifth child Huzza Jen had lost, the seventh Mao had lost. With Huzza Jen out of the picture, Mao married the beautiful actress, Zhan Qing. 
As a movie actress, John Ching was known by the sexy stage name Lan Ping. She achieved prominence with the role of Nora in the play The Dollhouse, but she was mostly a grade B actress. Some say she had a dubious reputation. It's one of the things people say about prominent, aggressive women. Not long afterwards, the two had their only child, a daughter. As the Sino-Japanese War goes on, Mao is promoted in Chinese communist propaganda as a popular anti-Japanese patriot. Wherever and however the Red Troops move into battle, they spread the glory of Mao Zedong and the greatness of the communist cause. On their backs, they carry posters and slogans as they march through the countryside. When the war ends in 1945, Mao's guerrillas have grown from 40,000 to 1 million. For post-war China is a nation exhausted by battle. People eat grass, misery and hunger are deeply etched on the land and on the people. At the end of World War II, the Soviets gave the Chinese communists huge stockpiles of captured Japanese arms. The nationalists received vastly more aid from the United States, including 50,000 American troops who occupied key cities and ports in northern China for Jiang's forces. In 1945, Mao courageously agreed to come to the wartime nationalist capital, Chongqing, to negotiate with Chiang Kai-shek. He stayed negotiating from August to October. Then, sensing victory, Chiang Kai-shek ordered his forces on to the attack. Mao returned to Yan'an. Things went badly for the communists. By the end of 1946, Chiang Kai-shek had seized more than 100,000 square miles of communist territory. By March 1947, Jiang's forces had surrounded the communist base camp at Yan'an, forcing Mao and his followers to retreat. Enemy advances, we retreat. Time and again, Chiang Kai-shek's stronger, better equipped army units find themselves fighting an elusive, shadowy enemy that melts into the mountains. And in the midst of battle, communist soldiers harangue the nationalists calling on Zhang's troops, often with great effect, to desert to the communist side. In June 1947, Chiang Kai-shek declared absolute victory. Once again, Mao had lured the enemy into an overextended and overconfident position. Cool under fire, Mao made himself a personal target. Knowing how anxious the nationalists were to capture him, day after day, he waited until their forces came within half an hour of his camp before saddling his horse and riding to safety. It got his juices flowing. The famously constipated Mao noted that he never shit so regularly as when he was in battle. By the summer of 1947, the trap had been set. Mao ordered his troops to abandon guerrilla warfare and go on the offensive. The pivot was Manchuria. Zhang's forces there collapsed during the winter of 1947-48. The Nationalist Army fell apart. On October 1st, 1949, Mao stood in Tiananmen Square in Beijing and proclaimed the establishment of the People's Republic of China. The boy from Shaoshan had done very well, but there was a price. In 1942, his one remaining sibling, his brother and advisor, Mao Zemin, was also killed. Mao Zemin's body, lying in the grave. Mao Zemin's body is a lion in the grave. Mao Zemin's body is a lion in the grave. But his soul goes marching on. The stars above in heaven now are looking kindly down. The stars above in heaven now are looking kindly down. The stars
With victory, the people will be grateful to us and the bourgeoisie will come forward to flatter us. There may be some communists who were not conquered by the enemy with guns and were worthy of the name of heroes for standing up to these enemies, but who cannot withstand the sugar-coated bullets. They will be defeated by the sugar-coated bullets. We must guard against such a situation. Mao now faced the daunting task of building a country. The serious task of economic construction lies before us. We shall soon put aside some of the things we know well and be compelled to do things we don't know well. The U.S. government's reluctance to deal with his regime made the job more difficult. The prestige of U.S. imperialism among the Chinese people is completely bankrupt. Mao threw oil onto the fire by announcing that China was going to lean to the side of the Soviets. Then, on June 25, 1950, North Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel into South Korea. Two days later, President Truman ordered the 7th Fleet into the Taiwan Straits, preventing the CCP from taking Taiwan. In the fall of 1950, after a U.S. counterattack, the North Koreans fell back across the 38th parallel. The American commander Douglas MacArthur threatened to push through to Manchuria and liberate China. Mao convinced a reluctant Politburo to vote for war. After studying MacArthur's record, Mao declared that an arrogant enemy would be easier to defeat. In October 1950, overconfident U.S. troops approached China's border. MacArthur boldly announced his Home by Christmas campaign, insisting that the few Chinese forces who had entered the fray had turned tail. Enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy camps, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. Suddenly, right after Thanksgiving, Chinese forces surrounded the U.S. troops. It was a rout. Within a matter of weeks, they had pushed the startled Americans back to the 38th parallel. Peace was concluded almost three years later. China had fought the most powerful nation in the world to a standoff, a stunning achievement. It cost almost 900,000 Chinese troops. Among them, Mao's own son, An Ying. The talented and handsome An Ying was the only relative to whom Mao was close after 1949. Although married and easily able to get out of the draft, An Ying volunteered to serve in the military during the Korean War. Mao's nervous comrades didn't dare tell him about his son's death. Months later, when General Peng Duai accidentally let the news slip, Mao collapsed, shaking so violently he couldn't light his cigarette. A grieving Mao refused to part with his son's shirt and socks. Of course, Mao's suffering wasn't exactly unheralded. The public was made aware of the sacrifices the father and the son endured for them. It's a lesson that politicians of other countries might well consider. Even while the war was raging, Mao was tweaking a land reform policy devised to give every one of China's peasant families a piece of private property. He was establishing a nation of capitalist landowners. 
In 1949, land reform had been carried out in less than one-third of the Chinese countryside. After taking power, Mao went slow, confiscating only the land of the wealthy and leaving alone most of those who had supported the communists. The Korean War sped up the process. The anxious government pressed young, poorly trained workers into service. They exercised little restraint over villagers. Most of the people were afraid that because of their property, so they are going to be a bigger landlord. So they sold all their land very cheaply. So my grandfather thought that's, oh, the price is, was down. And then he thought that was a good time to buy. So he was a very innocent man. So he bought all the land, a lot of land. Instantly, he became a big landlord. They arrested him, and then they go to the struggle and ratification meeting. He was executed on the spot. Mao berated local officials to stop the carnage. But by 1952, when land reform was completed, millions of landlords had been killed. But by no means all. My father, his relatives, landowner class, and they were scared of communists. So, they, so my father and my mother, they left their area and came to Shanghai to escape communists. In 1952, Mao began a campaign against corruption, waste, and bureaucracy that attacked former Kuomintang officials. My father was a Nationalist Party member. The party had a campaign, anti-counter-revolutionary. His job, he was kind of demoted from the office work to the shop floor. But his salary remained the same. Uh, it's fortunate for him to be demoted earlier on. <laughs> no power, right? Most of those campaigns targeted people with money, so-called capitalists, bourgeois, or people with power. And my family, like most of Chinese, do not belong to those categories. In spite of the war, by 1952, Mao had brought China's floundering economy back to its pre-war height. He restored the educational system and virtually eliminated crime, prostitution, and infanticide. The government he established was officially a united front. He made non-communist former Democratic Party leaders heads of 11 of the 24 government ministries. Though Mao regularly sought the advice of the educator Huan Yenpei, few of these non-communists held real power. Mao was open to foreign advice. He allowed Russian advisors to help set up the government, army, and educational system on the Soviet model. But the West refused to have anything to do with China after the Korean War. Uh, most teachers that the young generation should uh, uh, embrace the whole world, concerned about world affairs. Um, so our mentality is different. It's not just uh, in our mind we want to have a house and a car. That was not our life, you know. But that was the life of majority of Americans choosing or pursuing, and that's all they care about. In January 1953, Mao announced a five-year plan for building the economy. Like similar plans in the Soviet Union, the Chinese plan emphasized heavy industry, steel, cement, chemicals, machine tools, and electric power. It worked. During its first five-year plan, China's industrial production grew at a rate of almost 18% per year. This was a huge, almost unheard of increase. In five years, China's industry doubled. Those who think the Chinese economy under Mao languished are dead wrong. To improve peasant life, Mao urged groupings of five or six families to form mutual aid teams in which they pooled their tools and helped one another through the growing season. Gradually, the teams were encouraged to join together into cooperatives. 
In the summer of 1955, Mao complained that those who wanted to go slow were tottering around like women with bound feet, complaining all the time about others. China's Soviet system was not geared for subtlety. Mao pushed, officials responded. By the end of 1955, two-thirds of the countryside had formed cooperatives. Mao called for bigger cooperatives. Again, the people responded. I think we went too fast. By 1956, China had collectivized with far less violence than the Soviet Union. For a few short months, Mao even got people to use their spare time to swat flies and mosquitoes and exterminate rats and vermin. Mao pushed ahead, meeting with businessmen to talk about the collectivization of commerce and industry. The businessmen, not that they had much choice, endorsed Mao's program. By early 1956, almost all private businesses, big and small, had cooperatized. By the end of 1956, Mao had unified China, created an awesome rate of growth, restructured the education system, and improved living standards. Peasant income rose. Worker income rose. The percent of children in primary schools doubled. Life expectancy, the best indicator of a country's health, jumped from 36 years to 57 years. By the mid-1950s, Mao could have looked around at everything he had done and said it was good. Instead, he decided to become a Maoist. In 1956, Mao, now 62, had been head of China for seven years. Mao spent his days lolling in an enormous bed. From his bed, Mao wrote poems, oversaw policies, and read pornographic novels to stimulate his performance for the nubile young women sent in to service him. When she was gone, his eyes looked around. He didn't treat his baby. I wash my prick with cunt. Mao did not care to wash his body in the regular manner. His bodyguards would rub him down every morning, often sticking their fingers up the chairman's ass to get the old man's bowels flowing again. Mao proved himself a somewhat indiscriminate but equal opportunity sexual predator, often making passes at his male as well as his female attendants. To the consternation of his doctor, Mao also refused to brush his teeth to the point where green ooze covered his molars. A tiger never brushes his teeth. Still, in between his peculiar body rituals and sexual hijinks, Mao decided to eliminate the centralized Soviet system that he and his colleagues had built in China. In April 1956, Nikita Khrushchev, the new head of the Soviet Union, denounced his former mentor Stalin. Mao reacted by calling for more learning from foreign countries and the elimination of two-thirds, that's right, two-thirds, of the party bureaucracy. Let a hundred flowers bloom, let a hundred schools of thought contend should be taken as our guideline. There's a red rose in China. Mao invited intellectuals, peasants, students, workers to speak out, to expose government corruption and debate new ideas. Nobody else but Mao. He acknowledged the grievances of the Tibetans and other minorities. Alarmed bureaucrats warned China could become another Hungary. 
Mao waved off this concern and radically expanded the circulation of a newspaper called Reference News that contained articles from the non-Chinese press. He made it available throughout the country. Mao gave a talk in which he argued that the party held no monopoly on truth. On certain questions, the people might be right and the party wrong. If they have something to fart about, let them fart! Once it is out, one can decide whether it smells bad or good. If the people think their farts stink, they will be isolated. Outraged party officials walked out of the talk. China's second highest official, Liu Xiaoqi, did not appear in the photograph of officials at Mao's speech. One afternoon in 1957, Mao called the editors of People's Daily to his bedside. The astonished journalist walked in on a chain-smoking Mao clad in a towel and pajama top, his fat belly protruding. For four hours, he lectured the group on the need to open the party to outside criticism. By the spring of 1957, students and intellectuals were publicly denouncing the government and criticizing the slowness of economic progress. Workers were striking for better conditions. Pressure by party leaders to stop the campaign mounted. In June, Mao finally caved into the pressure and signaled that criticism of the party needed to be toned down. For the next month, Mao still argued for leniency for dissidents. But by July, the anti-rightist campaign to cut off the heads of the poisonous weeds was underway. Students and intellectuals were arrested and sometimes executed. Deng Xiaoping, the man later credited with leading China away from the intolerance of the Maoist system, led and prosecuted this campaign. Still determined to throw the mindless communist bureaucrats out of office, in 1957, Mao began a new production campaign, The Great Leap Forward. He hoped this movement would get the people to rise up and with one huge effort transform and communize their lives. If human beings only live to eat, isn't that like dogs eating shit? What meaning is there to life if you can't help others a bit or practice a bit of communism? After Sputnik was launched, there was quite a bit of euphoria in the socialist blog uh, about the ability of the socialist countries to compete against the West. And then Mao and some of his colleagues went to Moscow to participate in a celebration. And that time, as Khrushchev was announcing that the Soviet Union was going to catch up with the United States, Mao basically noted that China would like to catch up with Great Britain first. He was also pretty cautious in the beginning in saying China cannot compare with the Soviet Union, couldn't therefore hope to catch up with the U.S. in a certain number of years, so he only announced that China was going to catch up with Great Britain first. Mao emptied administrative offices, sending officials to work in fields and factories. Even Mao himself went off to dig gravel, working until he got red in the face. Peasants erected buildings and dug irrigation projects. Villagers built small chemical and fertilizer plants. They mined low-lying coal deposits using hand labor. Every locality sprouted a backyard steel furnace. The State Planning Commission gave Mao figures showing steel production increasing beyond his wildest imagination. On visits to factories, local bosses explained how workers had rebuilt old machinery to achieve huge new production goals. Provincial leaders told a skeptical Mao that by building new irrigation works and changing techniques, Peasants had figured out how to increase harvest by as much as 70 times old levels. Mao told them they were producing more than they could possibly use. Communes, 
the new administrative organ in the country, built rural nurseries and mess halls to free women from household tasks and allow them into the labor force. With men engaged in large-scale irrigation projects, women took over in the field. Others went to work in cities or factories. It's the first time the government began to allow villagers to set up their uh, own schools, high rural teachers, they call them Minban school. Before the anti rightist movement, I think the Chinese educational system was uh, run by the so-called bourgeoisie intellectuals. I don't think they have a particular interest in expanding education to the rural areas. We abolish aristocratic schools so children cadres integrated with people's children. A lot of the people uh, who used to speak up did not dare to speak up anymore. Anyone uh, who actually wanted to be in, in terms of the political system, wanted to follow cues from Mao. So they were bidding against each other, competing in following Mao's wishes. Local leaders, alerted that Mao's special train was coming to town, built furnaces along his route, put peasants in new, colorful dress, and even transplanted rice into thousands of fields at such great density that electric fans were necessary to prevent the plants from rotting. Communities in rural areas, essentially, and now in communes during the Great Leap, began to launch a program essentially to allow farmers to eat as much as they can. And in this process, very often, normally prudent farmers began to exhaust their grain supplies. A lot of the farmers were diverted from farm work to irrigation to the production of steel. So in 1958, for example, there was a bumper harvest, but a lot of the harvest was wasted in the fields. There were not enough people to collect them. Other problems distracted Mao. In March 1959, rebellion broke out in Tibet and the Dalai Lama fled, as Mao, during the Hundred Flowers campaign, had predicted he might if the attitude toward minority groups didn't improve in China. Mao personally gave the order not to pursue and capture him. A few months later, Mao, worried about the problems with the Great Leap, visited his hometown of Shaoshan for the first time in more than 20 years. Old friends and relatives talked about the difficulties they were experiencing, but also showed him a harvest whose thousand waves of rice and beans Mao celebrated in a poem. Mao left Shaoshan determined to moderate the Great Leap. But the disciples plotted against him. Foremost among these disciples was Peng Dehuai, the Judas of the Chinese Revolution. Peng grew up in a small village near Mao's. He and Mao fought side by side in the 1930s at a time when Peng had few peers as a tough revolutionary commander. In 1935, Mao even wrote a poem celebrating Peng's accomplishments. High mountains, long roads, deep gullies, forces galloping in every direction. Who dares to ride on horseback with his sword drawn? None but our great General Pong. After the success of the revolution, Pong commanded the Chinese forces in the Korean War. He assigned Mao's son, Anying, to a headquarters job and then forgot to bring him into the shelter when the bomb struck. There didn't seem to be any hard feelings on Mao's part. Peng became defense minister of China. He was one of a small inner circle who helped Mao govern. And it was as one of these people that he was to betray Mao. Around the time Mao went to Shoshan, Pang went to the Soviet Union. Pang's visit came not long after Mao had promoted another military man, Lin Biao, above Pang in the Politburo. When Pang returned from his talks with Khrushchev, the Soviet leader canceled all contracts to supply the Chinese state, exacerbating the problems with the Great Leap. 
by the early summer of 1959, Mao was actually calling his senior colleagues into a retreat to see whether there needs to be a, some adjustment. Unfortunately, some event intervened. That is, his defense minister, Peng Dehuai, wrote a memo and basically criticized some of the policies. Mao was taken aback, launched the political counterattack uh, at what is known as the Lushan Conference of 1959. In his letter, Pang suggested that Mao had become so out of touch that he did not even know how bad things were in his own village. Pang was fairly blunt, and Mao took it as a, a challenge to his power. And it doesn't help that Peng, first of all, was the defense minister. And in any country, anyone who has a major influence on the military is seen as a potential power player, and Peng certainly was a power player. Peng was not born yesterday. He was, after all, the second best strategist in China. He knew what had to be done to topple Mao. He talked to his commanders in the field. He had talks with Khrushchev to get Soviet backing. I praise Khrushchev. I betray Mao. You give me my camels now. Pang only made one mistake. He forgot he was the second best strategist. He was going up against number one. At least that's the way people understood what happened until Mao died in 1976. In the Bible, we hear Jesus' side of the story, never Judas's. Dressed in a white robe and slippers, Mao went to a meeting of the Standing Committee of the Politburo, ranting that in spite of taking sleeping pills three times, he had not slept. He told the group that he was without an heir because one son was killed, one went mad. An allusion, no doubt, to Pang's role in his son's Korean War death. Some, like Mao's old partner, Zhu De, stood to defend Pang. Zhu suffered no ill consequences. The others agreed to replace Pang as defense minister and ultimately to charge him with leading an anti-party coup. At the Lushan Conference of 1959, up jumped Peng Duai and said, uh, You fucked my mother for 40 days. Can't I fuck your mother for 20 days? All this fucking messed up our conference and the work was affected. Mao allowed Peng to remain a member of the Politburo and keep his title as vice premier. Still, in the wake of the Lushan meeting, the policies of the Great Leap intensified. Agricultural production declined precipitously. Massive famine erupted. So we have a famine that is the worst in human history. Uh, the normal, uh, just looking at the uh, uh, population numbers, you, hear, you see the Chinese population declining from 1959 to 1961 by around 16 million. For the massive number of people who died, Mao bears responsibility. I was five years old at the time. I remember very well uh, the hunger my family and the fellow villagers in my village suffered. We didn't have enough to eat, there's no doubt about this. Most people didn't blame on the government policy for that because there were natural disasters for two years on a row, and we had a huge flood. But most people today don't look at, you see, what the positive contribution Great Forward did. And the Chinese farmer at the time was really, really mobilized, and they worked very, very hard. The Great Leap continued full bore for another year. In the summer of 1960, when the full extent of the problems became apparent, Mao dismantled the communes, restored free markets and private plots, and acknowledged he had made mistakes. In 1962, Mao turned day-to-day -day operations over to Liu Xiaoqi. Business returned to usual. There was to be one other effect of the leap.
during the Great Leap, particularly in 1960, 61, and 62, in those years, and uh, so sort of a lot of communities helped by local leaders who had become totally disenchanted with the Leap policies, began to essentially contract land and assign land to individual households, especially in those communities, in those provinces which had suffered the most from the famine. The Great Leap really uh, steered China away from the goals of communism in rural areas, fundamentally. In the early 1960s, Mao again lashed out at China's mindless Soviet-style bureaucracy. We should set a time to carry out democratic elections. Terms of office should, in general, be limited to four years. Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping opposed Mao's attacks on the country's chief administrators and didn't like it when Mao referred to these lackeys as capitalist rotors. Mao revealed to his old buddy Edgar Snow that then and there he decided that his two lieutenants needed to go. At present, you can buy a branch secretary for a few packs of cigarettes, not to mention marrying a daughter to him. By the end of the Cultural Revolution, Mao had pruned China's vast bureaucracy down to one-sixth of its former size. He had ousted more than 70% of the communist toadies on the Central Committee. This housekeeping was to have particularly salubrious effects on China's economy. By the mid-60s, Mao had also begun to blast his country's elitist educational system. Nowadays, first, there are too many classes. Second, there are too many books. The pressure is too great. He praised what some would call cheating, others, cooperative learning. At examinations, whispering into each other's ears and taking one another's places ought to be allowed. Your answer is good and I copy it, then mine should be counted as good. He encouraged young people to ignore droning, sanctimonious teachers. Rather than keeping your eyes open and listening to boring lectures, it is better to get some refreshing sleep. You don't have to listen to nonsense. You can rest your brain instead. For the next 10 years, during what was called the Cultural Revolution, Mao focused on improving rural education. My mom never went to school. My father never went to school. My mom, even today, didn't know how to recognize her own name. The four of us, because of Cultural Revolution, we all had, we all had you see, a high school education. During what is usually called the wasted decade of the Cultural Revolution, primary school enrollment increased from 116 million in 1965 to 150 million in 1976. Middle school enrollment grew from 9 million in 1965 to 67 million in 1977. This was an increase of more than 700%, or 30 times the population growth. Before the Cultural Revolution, we have one high school. By the time the Cultural Revolution was over, 1976, we had 89 high schools in the county. I think the educated elites didn't care about farmers' children, whether they receive education or not. It's not important to them. But the farmers did want their children to have education. While schools multiplied in rural areas, in cities, schools closed up for two years. 
this wasn't all bad. No more pencils, no more books, no more teachers' dirty looks. The early days, no school, so we, we didn't have to worry about examinations and tests and those things. And I just spent time reading novels. That's what I love to do, so that's, I just, uh, that's what I did. Uh, those Red Gods, they just ransacked the school libraries and took whatever books they want and took home. Even the countryside. People would bring some books like Balzac or that kind of thing to read. It's you know. so a lot of free reading. And recently, I think a Yale professor was talking about how to read a novel. He said, don't ever read novels th thematically. Always think about little detail. That's a correct reading. And I realized my reading, the cultural revolution, was correct reading. <laughs> Those attacked during the Cultural Revolution years have argued that Mao and his wife, Zhang Qing, sought to replace the rich culture of China with revolutionary slop. To think about cultural revolution has appeared the way, uh, cultural wasteland is, uh, is really a misperception of the period. Now think about the greatest music, operas, novels, films, and also sculpture, especially painting. All this art is flourished. Those who criticize the Cultural Revolution like to point out that Mao's wife, Zhang Qing, only allowed eight model operas to be produced. In fact, there were ultimately 16 model operas, several of which were really ballets. But even this doesn't explain the rich offerings created during this period. The world's most sophisticated culture reached the tiniest little villages. After six months of physical labor, I was chosen to sing the opera. And uh, the purpose is to train the peasants, also try to sing uh, for the peasants. Now, how many classical Peking operas? All limited, because Peking opera is a kind of form that is not really created every day. And for Chinese to enjoy that, a Peking opera. It's really, you go to see it again and again and again. I think it's like to go to what a Shakespearean kind of drama. And ballet, the same form. How many new ballets we create here each year? And we watch again and again. When we were in the Cultural Revolution, behind, uh, like two blocks away, it was the theater. It showed the Red Lantern, like whole month. I was there the whole month. <laughs> we seen each and every line. We were expecting something to happen. So that's our culture. When I was on the farm, model operas, picking operas, was a major form of entertainment for us. We had a great fun. You just imagine all these teenagers, yeah. you know, working on the farm, doing hard physical labor. Now you got to sing model operas, and for one day, you don't do any work. How to change the culture? That's what cultural revolution is about. Jiang Qing taught one that you can't only get rid of the old, because the old is always there, because that's a tradition. So that's why they came up with the slogan that is, we have to combine the old with the new, that we use Peking opera as a form, and we give a new content. So in the traditional story... Yeah, the previous, the victim. original story. She, the the white-haired girl is a victim. Right. Uh, the white-haired girl herself doesn't have much fighting spirit at all. She was raped by the landlord and got pregnant. She cried most of the time. She didn't know how to do everything. And then Jiang Qing picked it up as this, uh, this, is this raw material for model theater for this ballet. What is deleted from the ballet is this girliness, this weakness, dependency. In the film version, it's very interesting. The ending was that when Da Chun, the fiancé, find she or find the girl, and they say, oh, I find you. And then they get married and live happily ever after. And in the model theater, 
mm -mm, they're not getting married at all. And this ambiguity, whether they're still fiancé or something, or, or, or revolution or comrades in revolution, we don't know. But then in the end, this white-haired girl got this red scarf on her head, very beautiful visually, and then pick up a gun. She joined the Israel army fighting for Chinese revolution. Women hold up half the sky. For the first time in Chinese history, women were told they were equal to men. I grew up in the Maoist era and also went through the revolution. When I was a child, seeing the whole education system would never say that girls are not as good as boys. Usually we're better. We, we feel that we are number one in study and we can be uh, good leaders. We care about other people more than boys. On the farm, we, of course, we do all kinds of work together with men. Okay? Young men of my age or a little bit older, whatever. We do the same physical, physical labor. I never felt that there's something men cannot, can do, I cannot do because I'm a woman. I never, never had one moment of this kind of thought. Because the whole, you call it propaganda or whatever, um, media, representation, we see numerous heroines everywhere. People's Liberation Army women who uh, is repairing the telephone line. That picture called, I'm a seagull, 我是海燕. And it's really strong women up there and fixing the pole. And you feel that I want to be that, that person. When I came to the United States, I was shocked by the, not just media representation of women in this country, um, the actual mentality of women in this country shocked me. I remember the first year I was here, I stayed with an American family, and uh, she had a friend come, and was, of course we had a conversation, asked, uh, she said she had a daughter, I said, oh, what are your daughter doing? Oh, she was so happy and so proud of her daughter. Oh, she's a cheerleader. <laughs> I said, what is cheerleader? I did not understand it was cheerleader, but I was very interested in leader, you know. <laughs> not only got dirty and serious during the Cultural Revolution, they also had fun. During the Cultural Revolution, the population increased tremendously. <laughs> so that's a good sign. <laughs> because all those powerful people, they're, they're busy you know, persecuting other powerful people, people with privileges and political struggles, and the majority of people without privileges left alone. What were people doing? Babies. <laughs> All these girls got pregnant most of the time because they said, we have the system called yi bang yi, yi dui hong. One help and we both can be read. So it's kind of a heart to heart. We have to talk heart to heart talking process. I mean, actually, that's dating. Dating calls for the ability to share good times, to learn from each other, and when suitable, to show affection without endangering your well-being physical, emotional, or moral. Mao had been a supporter of women's rights and even of greater sexual freedom for women from his youth. He began to promote the writing of new ballets and operas in the early 1960s. But the real cultural revolution didn't get underway until the summer of 1966. It started with a splash. In July 1966, Mao was filmed battling the waves of the Yangtze River for two hours. At age 72, he was still ready to take on all comers. Bombard the headquarters. Although some consider him a diabolically violent person, Mao started his attacks on the party's mindless bureaucrats by arranging for a literary critic. That's right a literary critic, to write a review of a play about the dismissal of a 16th century official. In most countries, literary criticism would hardly seem a fighting issue. Yao Wenyuan, the critic, belittled the play's suggestion that good officials lead from above. 
He argued the play should have emphasized the need to teach the people to air their own grievances. This was too much for China's Stalinesque officials. They not only defended the play, but tried to prevent the article from being republished outside of Shanghai. Mao's followers moved to have the guilty officials dismissed. As is always the case with politicians, there may have been some personal vendettas involved in these actions. One of the dismissed officials was Yang Shangkun, the government propaganda chief who had bugged Mao's personal railway car. This incident became known because one of Mao's mistresses overheard some of the buggers gossiping about the intimate details of Mao's liaisons with the string of young women who accompanied the chairman on his rides around the country. They made it known that the great helmsman was not a great coxman. Striking another blow for the Maoists, a young woman philosophy professor mounted a poster on a wall at Beijing University denouncing school administrators for prohibiting discussion of Yao Wenyuan's literary criticism. She urged intellectuals to go into battle. Tis great to be a soldier with a musket in your hand, ready for any bloody work the Lord's of Earth command. Mao praised the poster. Party business, the kind authoritarian regimes usually carry out behind closed doors, had suddenly been made public. Throughout China, students formed activist groups. To rebel is justified. In August 1966, Liu Xiaoqi was labeled the leading person in authority taking the capitalist road. Could there have been an unexpected reason for this? In a movie about communists, there have strangely been no Jews mentioned, a group usually associated with both movies and communists. Sure, we could have talked about Tugun Cohen, the thug from Calgary who worked as Sun Yat-sen's bodyguard. Or we could have mentioned the devoted Chinese communist Israel Epstein. Like these other two characters, Liu Xiaoqi had a huge schnoz. Was that where the rumor of his Jewish blood arose? Was he possibly a descendant of a well-known Jewish carpenter? Or was the story of his Jewish blood simply another heresy with which to charge China's leading capitalist roader? The historical record is murky. What is clear is that in the late fall 1966, Liu Xiaoqi and the second leading person in authority taking the capitalist road, Deng Xiaoping, disappeared from view. This wasn't hard for Deng to do, since he was well under five feet tall. Liu, however, died in 1969 from neglect and inadequate medical care after being transferred out of Beijing. Deng spent seven years in the countryside. Meanwhile, throughout China, students formed revolutionary Red Guard groups and marched on party headquarters. They raided files and posted secret speeches and documents. Aghast bureaucrats worried about the undermining of communist authority. Mao was unconcerned. Though, with no officials in charge, Red Guard groups sometimes turned violent. I saw people uh, beat people uh, in the street, in the school, students beat teachers. So the relationship between people really twisted. We knew very well that not all the Chinese did things as they did. Beating students better than sex. Even though it's red guard, they were claiming, oh, I was so victimized because, you know, I became so inhumane. I was started, started to beat people. I became so inhumane in that sense, you know. My human nature got distorted because of that. Beating cadres is better than sex.
there was a trend called scar literature. So star, that started kind of a victim discourse about cultural revolution, which lasted for so long. And in China, it did died out a little bit because people, they just move on. They didn't care about that part anymore. But in, in the United States, in the West, the people, this generation would find that it's commercial success when they wrote about the victim of a communist system. In fact, even Maoist leaders often found it difficult to contact Red Guard groups. This was not Stalin ordering the secret police to carry out executions. Mao was easing the restraints on the masses. In an atmosphere in which people were kept on a tight rein, violence erupted easily when controls were lifted. Mao, who appeared to endorse what some Americans call Second Amendment rights, made it worse with a remark he made during an inspection tour of central China. Why can't we arm the workers and students? When workers and students in fact started grabbing weapons away from the communist forces, Mao was unperturbed. Arms seizures are not a serious problem. factories, workers spoke out against the Communist Party bureaucrats ordering their lives. They forced disbursement of overtime pay, raised the limits of compensation on medical insurance, and expanded the coverage. In Shanghai, January 1967, a mass movement supported by Mao overthrew the municipal government and tried to put in place a representative body modeled after the Paris Commune. When the chaos expanded, Mao finally intervened, demanding alliances between old and new groups, rebels and cadres. He stopped the distribution of weapons and told the Red Guards to go to the countryside. Mao and Zhou dispatched a lot of the so-called educated youth, about 17 million of them, up to the mountains and down to the countryside. And farmers, because they were poor and blank, uh, as the official rhetoric put it, they were supposed to play the leading role in educating the urban youth. We're on the way, on the way to Grandpa's farm. We're on the way, we're on the way, on the way to Grandpa's farm. The educated urban youth brought to the countryside something the farmer didn't have. They brought uh, new ideas, new knowledge to the countryside. Some of the Sindang youth served as barefoot doctors, school teachers, and technicians in the countryside. They played a very, very important role in the Chinese uh, modernization process. We all like to teach them to learn. So we teach during the breaks, we teach them how to count, how to recognize characters. Then we also try to influence them, you know, if you have a good education, you can have a better life. First year I was here, I was invited by American friends at home. So they asked about, oh, Cultural Revolution in North China, what you did. And so I said, oh, uh, I was on a farm and we worked very hard. We dug canal with our hands, bare hands. Okay, just your spade to dug and show the post to carry away those dirt and to make build a canal. Oh, it's such terrible heavy labor you did. How do you feel? So, oh, I was feeling wonderful because it was so romantic to me that I was able to make great contribution to my country. the water running through the canal, we had tears in our eyes. I feel that's very romantic and it made us feel like we were like those revolutionaries. Then there's Americans say, oh, you're so brainwashed. <laughs> oh, you, you don't, yeah, you're so brainwashed. You don't know anything better. I was, I was so puzzled. I thought, why, why that was brainwashed? And later on, then I thought, hey, I saw in Yosemite, I see those uh, rock climbers, okay? Naked, baked in the sun and try to climb up. They took 
hardship as pleasure, right? <laughs> Why nobody said they're so brainwashed, they will take that as pleasure. <laughs> uh, when I uh, went back to the city after three years, I, I worry about them. When the weather turns bad, I just say, oh, if it's a drought or too much rain, they don't have a good harvest, how can they survive? They don't have enough to eat. By the close of the summer of 1967, barely a year after it had begun, most of the turmoil ended. One difference, ordinary workers, peasants and women were now represented in the leadership. The whole moment was to criticize the leaders. So that moment itself basically weakened the village leaders' control of the village. They knew the villagers were watching them. In the old days, they never worked with the farmers. During cultural revolution years, they started working with the farmers. Every central government documents were read to the farmers. And there were elections in the village as well. Before the cultural revolution years, the village leaders were appointed by the call mill leaders. And the production team leaders were appointed by the village leaders. And during the country years, all of these were elected. With a weakened government and a better educated peasantry, the rural economy blossomed. In 1965, only 17% of the countryside in the Shanghai area was machine tilled. By 1972, the portion was 76%. By the mid-1970s, better mechanization and new seed had begun a green revolution in China. Even in the radical days of the Cultural Revolution, certain rural communities were secretly adopting certain of the more individualist practices in, uh, as well, although they were careful in actually sort of in not showing it in public. But sometimes they did arrange farm work uh, on a household or team basis so that actually they can give actually more initiative to farmers. The Chinese uh, agriculture yield in my hometown, for example, more than doubled the yield. Rural communities, in the Cultural Revolution, there was a de-emphasis on trade, particularly private trade. So trade was tremendously, uh, uh, there was a serious effort in the 1970s to suppress domestic trade, and in connection with the self-reliance effort. And that actually is very detrimental to specialization and to the improvement in welfare. Industry grew much more rapidly than agriculture during the so-called 10 wasted years of the Cultural Revolution. Between 1966 and 1976, industrial production increased by at least 8% per year, high by any standards. We set up a village factory, and uh, there were more than 170 people in that factory, and uh, most of them were high school graduates. And we produced many, many products. We made a lot of income for the village. Local towns hired their own workers, creating a vast area outside the central Soviet-style planned economy. By the end of the Cultural Revolution, there were almost a million local industrial enterprises. They employed around 24 million workers and accounted for around 15% of all industrial output. These small industrial enterprises were the basis of the seeming miracle of China's economic takeoff following Mao's death. In 1965, at the start of the Cultural Revolution, more than 10,000 industries, accounting for 47% of state output, were under the direct control of central government ministries. By 1971, only 171 factories remained under central control because the state enterprises were simply not functioning very well uh, overall. But it would not be uh, until really the 1980s and early 1990s that the state enterprises get into real trouble. As Red Guard groups criticized the undemocratic, bureaucratic nature of the Soviet system in China, it opened their horizons. In 1989, when students collected in Tiananmen Square to battle the authoritarian government that had risen in Mao's place, many students drew inspiration from these old Red Guard groups. Mao did not 
as has popularly been believed, keep China isolated. In 1971, it was on Mao's watch and as a result of Mao's decision that first Kissinger and then the next year Nixon came to China opening up relations. From 1972 to 1975, foreign trade increased by almost 50%, and China again began sending students to Western countries. Right before he died, Mao said he had achieved two great victories in his life. The first was the defeat of Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese. The second was the Cultural Revolution. Swing low. Mao died on September 9, 1976. Oh, it was sad when that great ship went down. Oh, it was sad when that great ship went down. Oh, husbands and wives, little children cried all night. It was sad when that great ship went down. After Mao died, Mao's wife and three of his top officials were arrested. Labeled the Gang of Four, they were subjected to a televised show trial and imprisoned. Yeah, I think the trial is the grand finale of model theater. <laughs> so all these men, yeah, trial women for the crime that all men did. I, I, I don't know how to say that. It's so obvious that women's a scapegoat of any political disaster in Chinese history. Again, 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 that's the most modern one, hopefully <laughs> not happening anymore. The government intentionally made an effort to tarnish Mao's image in order to consolidate their own power. Mao may not have been the sun in the sky some claimed him to be. Nonetheless, Mao's reputation has never waned among ordinary peasants and workers in China. For millions of Chinese, Mao still offers hope. I think Mao, no doubt, was the greatest Chinese in the 20th century. I think he helped pave the way for Chinese modernization. <laughs> 